Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much for those of you who have decided to stay with us. <laughs> I know we've had a few people bail. Anybody else's tush here a little sore at this time? <laughs> time, 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 time. It kind of reminds me of that, you know, that last half hour when you're taking a plane ride somewhere, yeah. and you just can't wait to get home, and it seems like it's taken forever. You've already eaten that little teeny bag of peanuts that they give you. You've drank that little teeny cup of soda, and you just can't wait to get home. Well, I don't want this last part of today's presentation to feel like that for you guys, so I really want to try to have some fun with you all. I am honored to have been asked to speak here today because Baltimore Painted Furniture really is one of my passions. I've been in business for 26 years with my company starting out basically as an antiques business, but it's grown into a company that produces high-end furnishings, decorative arts, lighting, and murals. I want to give you a little bit of background about how I became so smitten with Baltimore Painted Furniture. And before I begin, <laughs> you, you know that anybody that's going to take the time to take a pair of yellow Converse sneakers and paint wing thunderbolts and wreaths on them has really got to love living and breathing this stuff. Put your foot up. Sure. Now, my background with painted furniture goes way back. And I, <laughs> I had to ask mom, who's 93, to dig through the family archives to see if she could find some photographs of my baby crib. Now, I'm going to have show you a before and after picture of the crib. Here's a standard crib. I guess they probably got it from monkey boards or something. You know, pretty plain and unadorned. And somehow I got my little infant figure, fingers wrapped around some black and gold crayons. And I somehow was able to crawl out of that crib and do foliated scroll work and wing griffins and amphibians on it. Can you imagine a little baby out there decorating that? <laughs> now, probably when I was about four or five, mom took me to the museum and there I beheld these incredible painted chair crest rails and was amazed to think that somebody would take the time to paint scenes of houses on a chair. How amazing to me. So as soon as I got home, I got my crayons out. And as you can see, I've done my versions of Mount Clare, Willowbrook, and Homewood. But unlike Francis Guy, I have myself there playing catch with my dog Misty at the top. And there I am down here riding my tricycle. You won't find that on any of the uh, Francis Guy paintings. <laughs> Now, my chair back paintings have definitely improved over the years. And I, I guess I have to tell you, as you all know, that that was all made up. But the, the fact of the matter is, I was a probably first or second year art college student. And my dad, a huge lover of antiques and a collector, we frequent Sam Pattison's auction house that many of you here from Baltimore might have known about Pattison's. It was really the place to get great, great stuff. So dad comes home with this set of very, I would say, homely Baltimore chairs that had already been stripped of their paint. They were in the raw. And under his arm, he's got what I was teasing Bill Elder about earlier. So he's got a copy of the Bible. He had gone to the library and got out Billy Elder's book on the, uh, it was the museum show from the, the mid-70s. And Dad asked me if I would paint this set of chairs for him with these scenes of houses on the back. Hmm. Believe me, this, this was not them. This was some years ago. I was in my 20s, and I was more interested in Jackson Pollock and Robert Rauschenberg at that time. And I had very little interest in doing this for him, but you know, he was my dad. And I decided to do it. So I, I love to think about what seed he planted that day by asking me to do those, those chairs. This chair you guys have seen already today is just like another view of it. But 
I wanted to bring to your attention something about Baltimore Painted Furniture that I think some of my colleagues failed to mention, that I think Baltimore Painted Furniture is some of the sexiest furniture that was ever <laughs> produced. It has incredible color. There's just all this drama with the painting. Look at, look at the sinuous form of that back and that curving crest rail. But I especially draw the attention of everyone here to the legs on this chair. I mean, the way that those legs taper and curve out, I mean, <laughs> does, doesn't it really make you think? I mean, or is it just me? Like, going there? And then this high style painting that was done on Baltimore painted furniture, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's just over the top with the color and the fluidity and all these different images and symbols. And again, when I look at this, it kind of makes me think of girls putting on their makeup. I bet you these gals probably were all finished up to look like uh, streetwalkers by the end of that. <laughs> now, flash forward. It's uh, 1986, and I had opened my first store at that time along Howard Street on Antique Rail. And I get a phone call one day from a gentleman named Norton Asner. He tells me he was an antique dealer here in Baltimore in the, in the old days, and his shop just happened to be at the same location where mine was, 891. That was his store years ago. So Norton says he wants to come down and meet me, and I said, well, sure, why not? I didn't think 45 minutes later that this, this huge tank of a car would come pulling up, and this guy comes in and just sits down with me and spins one fantastic tale after another about Baltimore furniture and some of these wonderful spoils of war that antique dealers just love to talk about, things that they found and things that they lost and what they made money on. So of all the stories he tells me that I loved was the story about this, which I don't call the able chair, but to me it's the quintessential Baltimore chair. Of all of them, it's definitely my favorite. And apparently, he turned up this set of chairs, at least from his story to me, by doing what he called knocking, just going door to door, house to house, and seeing if people had anything that they were really interested in selling. So he turns up these incredible chairs, and as you guys probably know now, there's some in the Met, some in private collections, the BMA owns a few, and I think there's one in the Kaufman collection, Michael, is that right? And I was so enthralled with this thing, I, I, I felt like I, I just had to have one. And, and I did, in fact, ask my good friend Michael Flanagan if he thought there was more of these floating around out there that maybe uh, I, at an Alice Cooper sale I'd pick a pair up, up at some point, and he said, no. There's, no. there's no more of these. So I think it was at that point that I really decided I, I wanted to take a stab at this and see if I could make some furniture like this. And it is really quite an undertaking to replicate something of this nature. Now, Wendy Cooper was kind enough, who was at the BMA at that time, to allow me to come and measure one of the original chairs. And one of the first things I have to tell you guys is that we must have added four or five inches to the back of the seat. The seats on these original chairs were so narrow that I don't even think Justin Bieber could have gotten his skinny <laughs> push in there. They were amazing. It was almost as if you were, they were made literally to sort of perch on the front. So we rescaled the chair, and we really rethought some of the things about the construction. I did know about the Finley chairs for the White House having failed, where some of those saber legs, they just naturally want to break. When you've got a long curve of wood, there's always going to be some short grain there that's going to want to fail and break. Am I right, Teddy? So we, we cheated where we could, and we splined the wood, which was cutting through the back leg, inserting a new piece of wood in the center with the grain running in the opposite direction. You can almost think of it as plywood in a way, but by having this sandwiched three pieces of wood with this spline in the middle with opposite running grain, it helps strengthen that leg. We've done this chair in the original uh, chrome yellow, green and gold palette, 
we did some in a black and red, which I have retained a pair for myself. I just love those. And we also did it in an off-white palette. There's a, there's a picture of one right here in the black palette. Oh, and by the way, this is, this is how we save parking spaces at McLean. <laughs> there's no folding plastic lawn chairs. Now, I love this chair so much that I managed, when given a mural commission a few years ago, to actually sneak one into the painting. And this, this is a full-size figure. Here's, here's the entire mural. And if anybody's ever down at the Tremont Grand, you've got to sneak into the lower men's room because that's, <laughs> that's where it is. This is a chair that we built early on, and it's it's it, it's kind of like the homely cousin to Baltimore chairs, is is in a gray gray. It's a very sort of pedestrian version, and it seemed like a good thing to play around with. I was trying basically to turn a sow's ear into a silk purse, so I probably over decorated this one, but it was basically like a tester, as an experimental piece, and I ended up giving it to a charity auction here in Baltimore. This next slide is a window bench that I did. And it was a really nice commission. It was several pieces of furniture which were created for the president of Towson University's personal residence in Guilford. And they gave me a little bit of freedom in terms of what I could pitch to them. So. I suggested, why don't we, this is Baltimore, why don't we do some Baltimore style painted pieces? And they ended up buying a pair of the yellow and gold chairs for me. And this window bench, which I designed in the style of Baltimore painted furniture, was something that probably grew out of a, a pearl of wisdom that Wendy Cooper dropped on me that day that she allowed me to measure the yellow and gold chair when I was there. And she asked me why I wanted to do it, and I told her I loved the chair and I wanted to own one. And you know, she said, that's all well and good, but why don't you think about this in terms of what you could do with it? Where could you run with it? What other kind of pieces might you do that would be inspired by some of this furniture? And I feel like I never forgot that, that, that day. The way she said it to me, it just stuck with me. And as I said, this, this piece, I wanted it to almost feel like something the Finleys might have done had there been more pieces to that suite of furniture. And perhaps there are some more pieces to that suite of furniture that haven't yet turned up. Here's a case piece, which you actually don't see a lot of cabinetry in this genre of furniture. But again, inspired by the quintessential chair, and it's a single shelf cabinet. It was done for a, a local collector. My very first opening slide, I don't know if anybody remembers, but it's actually a detail of the, the top of it, and you'll see another, another shot of that a little bit further on. Now, like most artists, I love my sketchbooks. I've, I've kept sketchbooks as long as I can remember. I, I probably have over a hundred of them. I sort of like to keep them in every room and every drawer, probably. And if I am in a cherry kind of mood, and I just love chairs, I'm one of these chair fetish people, I will just sort of sit down and doodle some. And I just grabbed a few random ones to show you and share with you. Uh, nothing that's not intended as a piece of art or a finished thing, but when I'm drawing and trying to come up with new designs, perhaps for my line, you can see there's quite an intermix of Baltimore, French, English and all of them, you know, blending in sort of a, a neoclassical form. That wheel back chair that you saw earlier, I have, I think I have about three or four of those in my little uh, chair hoard. And it's always a form that I have loved. We've never made one and I've always thought about ways to revamp it or update it. And here were some ideas that I had. This one, bars a leg from a, uh, a camp chair that's at, at Hampton, yet it's got the wheel back and uh, the curved spot that looks like the 
chair from the Lloyd family collection. And I guess I want to stop at this point and talk a little bit about the process of making this thing. They, they, these kind of sketches and drawings are really just the beginning of this process. You get an idea in your head and you begin by doodling out some loose sketches like this, which then, if one of them gets selected or if a client wants to have something made, it then becomes a more finished, measured drawing. The dra finished drawing stage might then lead to possibly building a miniature if, if we deem it necessary. Sometimes at the shop we feel like we're not sure what something's going to really look like. And I'm not that adept with computers that I can really model something on a 3D computer program. So sometimes we'll actually build little dollhouse sized versions of things. From that stage, you begin this whole process of the construction. You know, there's, there's the wood choice. And if I'm doing something that's inspired by Baltimore painted furniture, you really want to have a smooth surface. It's all about the surface. And anybody who has looked at this furniture will know that you're not seeing a lot of grain telegraphing through that decorative paint would interfere with the look of it. So there's that process of choosing a wood like a poplar or a maple or perhaps a cherry, which I think probably would have been standard procedure even in the Finley's day, to use those woods to work on because they have a great surface. You need to get that surface smooth. You need to get it gessoed and create this skin, so to speak, of, of what you're going to then work on next. The decorative painting, the base, the base color goes down, the decorative painting is then put on. I use whatever is available to me. I'm not like a stickler that I'm trying to reinterpret the way that they would have done it in 1815. So I still hand cut stencils, sometimes just out of cardstock, or I might use a little electric needle and burn them out of acetate. I have no problem using spray paint if I can get the right color, or we just mix a color that we want into a small gun and then spray it through the stencil. That gives me my basis of the decorative painting to work on top of. And then from there on out, you, sort of, you grind to a halt and you're doing a lot of handwork with very small liner brushes. I love these brushes that have bristles two and three inches long. They reduce the amount of handshake. You know, the older you get, I think, and I'm sure this doesn't happen to Debbie, but I occasionally <laughs> We'll find this little bit of handshake that will really interfere with getting that fine line work done. So these long brushes, it's, it acts like a shock absorber of sorts. It helps uh, minimize that. Now I'm going to get into the meat and potatoes portion of my talk. <laughs> it was in 1999 that I feel like I was honored to have been selected to recreate this lost suite of furniture that had been designed by my good friend Henry, Henry uh, Benjamin Latrobe for uh, <laughs> Dolly and James Madison. And I, I say I was honored to get this job, but it was, it really was a labor of love. As, as my good friend Janice would say, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I, I really wanted this project, but it dragged on and on forever. But nevertheless, it was probably one of the most eye-opening experiences that I had by I was feeling like I was back in, this, in the day with the Finleys and working with this idea of recreating this furniture from these wonderful watercolor drawings that the Maryland Historical Society owns and gave me access to. I even went down to Gay Street and walked around where their shop was. You, you know I'm crazy for this stuff, but <laughs> breathing in the air thinking, God, the Finleys, they were down here. You know, it was a few hundred years ago, but this is where their shop was. Well, we created a single window bench, just two of those Christmas chairs, and one of the Grecian sofa. Thank God I didn't have to make all the chairs that the Finleys did. <laughs> and just for comparison's sake, I wanted to put one of those Christmas form chairs uh, side by side with the quintessential chair. Just interesting to see the two of them together. And I like to think that the yellow chair, which came later, perhaps by seven to nine, ten years, I'm, I'm just going to put a guess on it, 
but they gave it this round turned front leg because they probably had so many problems with their saber legs, I imagine they just did not want to make any more. And it, it, it is a difficult thing to make, and you know, those chairs were like sculptures to recreate them. Here is a end view detail at the top of the, the sofa back, and then um, a front view of the, of the Grecian sofa that we did. And again, you know, the, it, it really is, I'm not going to show you more body parts, but it's very sexy furniture. I mean, it's very curvy and voluptuous, and this patriotic color palette, which we, of course, didn't have anything to match to, but just did our best based upon the color, watercolor renderings that Latrobe had done. So we knew that that's how they had been painted. Now, I guess about a year or two ago, I was contacted by PBS. They were shooting a film documentary about Dolly Madison. And I was honored that they wanted to pick my brain to see what I knew about locations where they could shoot and some of the furniture that we had created for the Madisons. And if I could help them track some of this down because they actually wanted to use it in the film. So I've just stolen a little snippet out of here. And if this thing works right, I will let you get a little short peek at this. She would transform it into a place where politicians could come together informally, a politically neutral space with music, food, and civility. She began by decorating and furnishing its austere public rooms. To execute the work, Dolly chose the architect of the U.S. Capitol building, Benjamin Henry Latrobe. She knew her choice of decoration would be seen as a political statement. The president's house had to be elegant enough to indicate the power of the office, but it also had to reassure the most pure-minded of Democrats that this was an executive mansion fit for a Republican. One of the great gifts that Dolly brought to James Madison was this understanding, unconscious, intuitive, of the importance of symbols. And she understood she was creating a symbol for America. Dolly required that the furnishings be American-made. The chairs and sofas incorporated Grecian and Roman motifs. The meaning was clear. Americans were the heirs of democracy. You know, they had the nerve to turn me down. I asked if I could play Latrobe. <laughs> no experience, but I really think I've been good. At any rate, it's a great little film, and PBS did it. I'm sure it's probably available online or maybe on reruns, but I, I know you would all find it very interesting. I have a few more sketches that I wanted to share with you. These are a little bit more of a finished drawing done in elevation, and they're measured. And as you can see, they're all drawings for benches. And, uh, I believe the bottom one we built, the other two were probably never realized. But this Baltimore furniture has just constantly influenced me. As you can see in the upper drawing with the round bolstered arms, which you've seen today over and over again, a very standard thing that was done on Baltimore painted furniture. The middle drawing has these small quarter round lunettes, they are called, which are on all four corners of that piece, and they act to capture the cushion, to keep the cushion from sliding off. And this lowest one is a saber leg, and this Agendart molding that you'll, you've seen similar details like that on some of the William Wan furniture. Here is a series of the trophies that you've seen on some of the other pieces today in slides, things that we painted. We recreated the Morris suite of sorts for a client some years ago. And I did my best to get my hands on as many images of what the Finleys had actually done for those trophies. But there wasn't enough to go around, and so I had to improvise. And if you look hard, I was able to hide a lacrosse stick in one of the. No, I'm just 
but they are all symbols of, of music and arts and war and different things. And I, I actually did reach out to some of these sources like uh, the, the Percy A. Fontaine and Thomas Hope books trying to help me find just the right images to work from. Next up is uh, this wonderful card table and I guess it's really where I sort of want to start conclude, conclude my talk by discussing sort of this long-term influence that Baltimore painted furniture has had on my career as an artist and a designer. And, you know, I just love these forms. And again, instead of slavishly copying them, I, I feel like the bar was set extremely high by the Finleys. And by studying this furniture over the years like I have, I really strive to do the very best that I can. This construction and design and the painting of it all is so beautiful. And I guess I feel like I sort of have a responsibility to uphold. I am carrying the torch, so to speak, for some of these Baltimore cabinet makers. And you can obviously see the direct influence of this more like pier table that we did a few years ago for a private client. It was simply built in poplar and paint gray woods. And the client asked us to do a faux bois finish in like a, a zebra wood with a ma faux mahogany trim around the top. But you know, that form is there. It's very shared in life. You can see the little, the little ears, as I call them, around the top and the notched front. And we gold leafed the cuff on the leg and the, uh, the ring around the leg. Here side by side is a window bench which features those little lunettes that I just spoke of a little bit earlier. And I've always loved this window bench and I still kick myself for not uh, waiting it out. There was, there was one of these at a Richard Opera auction many years ago where I was. It, it was in poor shape and the lunettes were gone and it had been repainted and I just had some other appointment and could not wait to see if I could snag that thing. But at any rate, that's probably why I've always loved it and thought it would be a fun thing to reinterpret it as a coffee table <laughs> that we did for a client. And you know, the, this, this cutout shape, which acts as a great basis for that large enthymion, is, is so much fun. You know, there, there, some of the, someone once said to me, you know, some of this furniture is kind of like costume furniture. It's like the costume jewelry of furniture. The, I like to think of it as a, the, the Finleys knew what some of this wonderful high style furniture looked like. It was just dripping with fire gilded bronze ormolu and yet they didn't have probably access to a lot of that. So what's the next best thing? If you don't have it, you do a faux painted version of it. And the, the colors of some of the things were so wild at the time. I know we looked at some of Debbie's slides with these restored colors and it's just amazing the brightness and the variety that you see. There's a example of two different benches that my company has produced. The upper ones, I think we made about 16 of these, and they are also down at the uh, Tremont Grand, which by the way was the uh, Baltimore's Masonic Temple. It's in the 200 block of Charles Street. And it's really one fantastic building. If you all haven't been there, you can walk right in the door because it is open and it's, it's a fabulous walkthrough, you know, take a self-guided tour. But we made those for their public spaces. And again, there's the, you know, the rolled arm detail, the square tapered leg with fluting. It's just I had to make everything so massive on those benches. And our shop, they, they looked like, um, they looked like Hummers sitting in there. They were just tremendous. <laughs> but this, this huge space down there at that temple just sort of engulfs everything. And really, uh, it, it ended up being a good fit. I did cardboard profile cutouts of them in full size and took them down there first to look at them just to make sure I had the proportions right. <laughs> the bench below, saber legs. It's got that round turned arm on the sides. But in this modern fabric and in like a stained gray walnut finish, you know, it really takes on a somewhat very contemporary or transitional form that could work with either antiques or uh, modern things. And here's that wonderful sofa from the William Wan suite, which is 
I guess my second favorite group of Baltimore fan furniture. And I wanted to give you a little preface of that so that I could then talk to you about some of these coffee tables, which we've made quite a number of actually. And in all sorts of color palettes, we've done them in the green color palette and an off-white. The one below is done in you know the, the typical red and black with a gold trim work. And again, you know, window bench, coffee table, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's a good way to talk somebody into building something that was sort of Baltimore inspired. The one above is a lot simpler with a stained gray wood top. And that client loved the shape and the form because it is a great shape and form. It just looks, it's, it's a whole other animal, minus all that decorative work. This, this was, again, derived from that Juan suite, but it was just a completely fantasized thing on my part to make like a long console table and extenuating those saber legs, again, with plenty of reinforcement. We did a cane top on it, which I thought was kind of fun. You don't usually see a console table with a cane top, but we gave the client an option of a glass top if they so chose. And here, lined up in the shop, ready for delivery, were three pieces that we did for our client. Uh, a pair of pedestals, were, which are actually a fairly reasonable copy of a pair. Gregory Wood Museum, but they're at West somewhere, right? Have you ever seen those? Yeah, I'm sure they're Finley. And they're uh, a, a dark green color palette. And I, I forget what museum has them. but. We, where are they? St. Louis. That's right. Thank you. Back there in the peanut gallery. The pink on the cheap seats. <laughs> the, uh, the yellow cabinet you saw earlier, and then the one to the right, again, this was strongly derived from that uh, red and black suite that was designed by Latrobe for William Wine. It has a small saber leg and very similar decorative detailing in the paint. This was a, a favorite project of mine, a bench that cl a client brought to me. It had been, unfortunately, overpainted, but it was a period 19th century Baltimore piece. And I was given the opportunity to redecorate it. And a twist that we added, which I think probably is something the Finleys probably would have considered doing themselves, the, the clients had a great love of music and the arts and theater. So instead of a romantic landscape or a house scene, we did these trophies or cartouches with you know the comedy and tragedy, and the other one had the scenes of music. I even went to the Thomas Hope source book to try to get a good face to work from that had that nice, strong, neoclassical look to it. This is a center table I made a few years ago, not for a client, just because I wanted to make it. And it's great when I have a little extra money around from time to time that I can do that and build a piece. But I, I just wanted to make this form. I was inspired by something out of the Percy A.M. Fontaine book, but I just kept thinking, you know, I bet the Finleys would have liked that table. And I bet the Finleys had given them enough time, maybe would have considered building something like it. So the, it's a very strong classical form. The paw feet were something that I, instead of carving, I sculpted them from clay and made a rubber mold and recast them in resin, and then they get gold leafed. Here's a detail of the pedestal, which I, I took the Percier and Fontaine uh, engraving and just sort of Finleyized it, so to speak, <laughs> to try to give it that look that I think that they were just so famous for. You've seen a nicer color image of this uh, Brown family pier table. But I included this image first because the following slide is a, a collector's cabinet that we were commissioned to do. And it was inspired in many ways by that piece. You'll notice there are the brown reeded cuffs that go around the, on my piece, they're, they're half turned pilasters. And this faux marbling is uh, unfortunately not very well read in this black and white image, but there's a like a warm sienna brown faux marble base on this. And this collector's cabinet had a single door, and there were four uh, of the 
uh, country homes painted in their Mondalmin, Tiraconnell, Tiraconnell, excuse me, farmlands, and Willowbrook. This table, which you've also seen today, I guess great minds think alike because I know we've picked some similar slides here, but I just, I love this X form table and I love seeing it over and again in its different manifestations. I was thinking about this about the same time I made that center table and I thought to myself, what if I pared this thing down to its most salient elements and did more of a contemporary version of it? So what, what I came up with was what I call my Delphi card table. And I did it in a, I call it a Steinway piano black lacquer, where it's just <laughs> layer upon layer of lacquer. They're all hand rubbed in between. And then layer upon layer clear lacquer over top of it, save for the uh, water gilded uh, reeded columns. And then the, the little footers are actually, I had um, Carl Saar, a great uh, a metal artist in here, hand forged those for me out of brass, and they slipped up on the table. So again, you know, you can you can obviously see where my like, design inspiration came from on this piece. You know, I went to the trouble to carve that little cockamamie finial that you see there because I thought it was such a great little detail, and I put it on my table, and it just it was just like a, a like a bump on a log. It, it just did not relate at all, so I ended up not using it. When you flip my table open, it has a bird's eye maple veneer top on it. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess to, to carry on the tradition of this high style painting and to always look for something new, which is so sort of part of the business that I'm in, there is a real fashion connection to furniture these days. So we're always looking for another new design, another new finish to do. And this particular cabinet is something that's in our regular line of furniture called the Cuvée Chest. And it features what is done with painting, but it's a chagrin finish, which chagrin, in the real sense, would have been a, a, a type of fish skin, sometimes from skate or stingray, that's dried and prepared and can be dyed. And then it's almost veneered over top of a substrate. And of course, we do it all with uh, our multi-layered paint process. The trim work around the upper legs, knobs, and edging of the top is all done in a faux ivory, which uh, the photo doesn't do it justice, but we, we take great pains to make that ivory have the right variation. It's got fine, feather fine, thin black cracking lines in it. And that multiple lacquer coating at the very end is really the thing that makes this stuff, I feel like, look as good as it does. My last slide is another new piece to my line, which is called the Garrett Cocktail Table. This is to imitate tortoise shell. And it's another one of these painstaking six to eight step processes just in the painting part alone to get that to look like what it does. Then we divide the different panels of tortoise shelling up with what, and you see the white lines, is actually like a faux ivory and ebony. There's a white ivory line in the center and ebony lines on either side. And without its many coats of lacquer at the top, it really wouldn't read like it does. We also offer this piece as a mirror and as an end table. Well, I really hope that I've shed some light on the journey that I've been on, and I know you guys are all kindred spirits out there with me, that you took the time out of your day to come here and listen to us speak and share this wonder of joys of Baltimore painted furniture. Does anyone have any questions? Well, thank you so much.